A very good evening from India to all our panelists and live audience joining us from around the world. My name is Malvika Seth, and it is my pleasure to welcome you all to the final discussion session of the Global Law School Summit on the theme of present and future of global legal education. This session is dedicated to the discussion on humanizing rights, postmodernism, and human rights. We have a distinguished panel of five speakers who will reflect on this topic and share their perspectives. Please allow me to introduce our August panel. Our first panelist is Professor Dr. Lyra Jakulovic, Dean Faculty of Law, Michaelas Romerus University, Lithuania. Our second panelist is Professor Dr. Vaisar Murthy, Vice Chancellor, RV University, India. Our third panelist is Professor Martin Scheinen, Professor of International Law and Human Rights, Bonavero Institute of Human Rights, University of Oxford, UK. Our fourth panelist is Professor Mark Tishnet, William Nelson Conville, Professor of Law, Emeritus, Harvard Law School, USA. And our final panelist is Professor Jill C. Engel, Associate Dean, Academic Affairs, Penn State Law University Park, USA. Thank you so much for joining us today for this discussion. This 60 minute session is divided into a brief introduction of the theme, followed by a moderated discussion with the panelists in a question answer format, ending with inviting questions from the live audience. In the interest of time, I request the panelists to restrict their responses to three to four minutes. I will now briefly introduce the theme of the session to lay the foundation for the discussion to follow. The modern day iteration of human rights as laid down in the International Bill of Human Rights is universal in nature. The present era has been described as the age of rights. Human rights are deemed to be inherent and attached to the identity of any and all human beings. The Universal Declaration of Human Rights or UDHR signed in 1948 was the fulfillment of the promise of the modern age to humanize society through the rights of individuals. These rights as posited by the UDHR and put into obligatory language by the two international covenants are heralded as a grand milestone in the evolution of humanity. However, the concept of universal human rights has not come through without significant challenge. The loss of cultural context has been a concern since 1948 when out of a total of 56 participating countries, South Africa, Saudi Arabia, and Soviet Union chose to abstain from signing the UDHR. Postmodernism in human rights, as in other disciplines, is essentially a departure from the grand totalizing meta-narratives of modernity. Any postmodern theorists uh, argue that human rights is in fact devoid of any universality. In postmodernism, the identity of the protector of rights as well as the claimant of rights has undergone a shift. The human rights struggle is no longer only between the, cit uh, the citizen and the sovereign state. For example, with the advent of transnational corporations with annual turnovers in excess of national GDPs of many developing countries, the language of human rights is being turned to combat corporate action and not just state action. The deconstruction of national and citizenship oriented identity allows for self-identification on the lines of ethnicity, religion, gender, sexual orientation, to name a few. These changes, however, may not detract from ideals laid down in the UDHR, as the UDHR obligations are for everyone and not just the state actor. Hence, it may ultimately allow for the language of universality to be employed for demand of cultural and relative rights for micro self-identities. The COVID-19 pandemic united the world in crisis and may have exposed some fault lines in the postmodern understanding of rights. On the one hand, the right to health, access to medicine and vaccines mm -hmm. was a universal call. And on the other hand, majority has rejected the right of communities for cultural or religious reasons to stand against vaccine mandates. The pandemic has exposed disparities between different countries and communities with several transnational corporations doubling their wealth as farmers and laborers went into crushing debt across developing nations. Maybe the new goals for postmodern discourse regarding human rights should be to include social contingencies of micro identities to help vulnerable groups 
achieve basic minimum universal standards by combating the specific hurdles created by such social contingencies. Without much ado, uh, I will now address my first question. The concept of human rights has oscillated between two theories of law, natural law and positive law. Essentially an unsettled debate over the source of human rights, whether they emanate from the inherent dignity of the human person or from the will of the sovereign state. May I request Professor Engel to reflect upon this? Thank you, yes, thank you so much. And, and good evening, good morning, wherever you are to everyone. It's wonderful to be with all of you. Um, <clears throat> I, I would like to frame my response to this question in the context of gender-based violence. Um, here in the US, we have an interesting approach to human rights in that we don't often call them human rights. And the US has been operating under this paradigm since our body of law developed. Uh, we have never um, adopted uh, even the language of human rights uh, very, very widely, uh, if at all, uh, certainly into our federal laws and statutes, uh, it does not appear. Um, and in although there are some uh, states and even towns which are becoming more open to um, adopting it in that, uh, in that context. And so I thought I would tell you an anecdote to illustrate what I mean by this. In gender-based violence, um, legal advocacy, we have struggled to name the problem and to understand the best way to provide legal advocacy and to provide positive legal outcomes for families, for women, and also um, for, for lawmakers. How do we address such a, such a complicated problem that occurs between two people intimately? One of the ways that colleagues of mine at law schools in the US have advocated is to go to city councils and even some small town councils like the, the town at Penn State here, here in the US, I'm at Penn State. This is our little mascot. And at Penn State, we're located in a very small town, town of State College, um, uh, less than 100,000 residents. And in my legal clinic uh, about 10 years ago, we, we joined a movement of law students and law professors across the country who advocated for a city, city uh, proclamation, a declaration, if you will, of our own, just like the UDHR, that freedom from domestic violence is a fundamental human right. And it passed here in State College, thanks to the advocacy of, of my students, which actually took almost three years to bring just that small declaration to fruition. And I add that fact to you for consideration because my students, when they began the project three years earlier, they actually went to, to state legislatures. So our state of Pennsylvania has millions of residents very big uh, geographic area here in the, in, the, in the state of Pennsylvania. And they lobbied the some of our state representatives to try and get this passed at the state level. And it was not acceptable. It was not even our local representative who philosophically believes in human rights and wanted to advocate for um, awareness of domestic violence. He, he tried and he failed because there was no acceptance of even the language of human rights into a statute among his colleagues. So I'll stop there for now, but I wanted to highlight that as a, uh, a challenge, but also a, a path forward for advocacy um, on, you know, in the nature of statutes uh, that can reframe the way we think about um, the fundamental human rights of those who might otherwise be vulnerable to violence. Thank you, Professor Angle. Uh, so from USA, let's move to India. Professor Murthy, 
May I request for your comment? Thank you, Professor Malavika, and greetings to fellow panelists and other participants. Um, it is not exactly an oscillation between the idea of um, natural law and uh, positive law. In fact, uh, the idea of human rights evolved over uh, centuries in response to various uh, historical stimuli like Holocaust and genocide. The idea of natural rights, uh, in fact, evolved over time after extensive critiques and eventually settled in the current notion of human rights. Values associated with natural law are now transformed into positive law. The Universal Declaration of Human Rights and the Covenants are clear in grounding human rights in human reason and human dignity. After valiant attempts to find philosophical foundations for the notion of human rights, scholars have veered round to the view whether it is indeed necessary to have a source at all. After all, human rights are moral claims which need to be respected for their own sake. The constitution and other laws only merely recognize what is otherwise inherent. If correctly interpreted, human rights are one of the best instruments societies has for defending uh, various liberties and for securing economic and social progress. In India, we can clearly see how some recent judicial interpretations uh, in the National Legal Services Authority versus Union of India, uh, otherwise known as Section 377 case, uh, which decriminalized the Indian Penal Code provisions relating to homosexuality between consulting adults. And in, the, in another case, um, Indian, uh, India Young Lawyers Association versus State of Kerala, popularly known as Sabarimala case. In both these cases, courts have relied on human dignity to apply a transformative approach in the interpretation of the constitution and upheld human rights of people. Today, we need not appeal to a higher or a divine law in order to defend our cause. We can appeal to the pertinent provisions under the current national and international framework of rights. Thank you, Professor Murthy. Uh, surely in India, there has been a drastic shift in terms of how we see human rights and how uh, the courts have come to agree that there is an evolution that is taking place and they are not sort of constant. So the sources may also be changing in that, uh, in that understanding. Uh, may I now move to Professor Martin to present to us a perspective from UK on this question. Thank you, uh, panel chair. Uh, your introduction indicated that there would be an unsettled dilemma oscillation between the natural school and the positive law school. I don't think so. I think we can say that the matter is settled. And I propose in the following way that morality is the origin of human rights. It is in the recognition of each and every human person as the subject. That is the essence of human rights and dignity comes into play, yes. And human rights enter the law as a discourse through the natural law school. But that's not enough. That's the historical background. Then we have the process of positivization. And I would say that the usual three sources of international law apply also in respect of the legal validation of human rights norms as norms of international law. So we have, of course, the treaty making procedure by states. That's one way of positivization. But we also have judicial recognition of custom and opinion juris uh, as crystallizing norms of customary international law. So there's a more direct link from morality, the background, 
through judicial action. And similarly, we have the distillation of uh, principles from national legal orders, mainly through comparative constitutional law, uh, as, as then recognition at the international level as general principles of law. So I see that we need both. We need the natural school to bring human rights into the discourse, and then we need the positive law school to make them valid norms within the framework of law. Thank you very much, Chair. Thank you so much, uh, Professor Martin. Uh, I'll quickly move on to the next question. My next question is, many provisions of the Universal Declaration of Human Rights reflect expressions of rights from earlier Western documents. But even if UDHR has its origins in Western philosophical thought, uh, does this necessarily mean it cannot be considered universal? Or does it leave micro-identities vulnerable to a global homogenizing force. Uh, I would request Professor Mark Tushner to uh, comment on this. Uh, thanks very much. So uh, I, um, I guess my first observation would be that although the sort of drafting origins of the UDHR may well have been mostly Western, although there was some um, what we now think of as Global South influence on it. Um, I think on reflection, uh, particularly for me, at least in connection with the debate about 20 years ago over uh, Asian values as contrasted with uh, uh, Western values in the uh, UDHR, um, it became clear that in the, um, call them non-Western tradition, in many non-Western traditions, there were rough equivalents of the concepts embedded in the UDHR uh, or the Western versions of the concepts embedded in the UDHR. Um, and so well, despite the, as I say, drafting origins, I think the notion of, in some sense, the notion of universality um, and transcultural relevance um, remains significant. Uh, but I want to stress that the uh, uh, postmodernist view does place some pressure on the sense in which uh, these are universal claims. Um, because even within the West, there are various understandings of uh, each of the, or many of the claims. And the point of, uh, one point of modernist discourse is to, postmodernist discourse, is to insist on the, call it for these purposes, local specificity of uh, uh, the, um, uh, of the instantiation uh, of the rights. So when you combine the fact that there are versions of these ideas available across traditions with the postmodern insistence on local specificity, the document does have some universality, but uh, it's brought to ground in various uh, quite actually distinctive and interestingly distinctive ways in a specific cultural context. Thank you, Professor Tushnet. And uh, yes, this idea of Asian values that has uh, sort of been troubling and taking from Professor Martin's comment here, uh, even Asian values to an extent have a morality integrated within it, which talks about uh, individual rights, which we have seen in ancient cultures, even in India, well, one of the first sort of iteration of right of food, right to food comes from Ashoka's uh, uh, epithets that he had created long back before all of this discussion of Western and uh, Global North and Global South. So, I uh, guess, thank you so much for that. Uh, Professor Lyra, may I request for your comment on this? Good afternoon, dear colleagues, uh, dear participants. It's a pleasure to, to join you uh, for this important event. Um, as um, the point about um, uh, cultural uh, aspects and universality have been uh, has been already addressed, um, maybe I will uh, start from a completely different point where we see um, the national specificities 
uh, nowadays, uh, which are very dear to particular countries, they are not necessarily related to, let's say, cultural aspects, but other um, ethnic aspects or uh, national security aspects. And uh, this also sometimes uh, gives the impression that uh, we don't really want universality because we need uh, something very specific for our countries, for our regions. But um, even in these kind of situations, I think uh, there is nothing uh, to do but just to, to go with uni universality, because in particular, when we deal with global crisis, and this is where, let's say, uh, there have been um, a number of very national and specific approaches to how uh, human rights should be balanced, let's say, with national security issues. Here, um, we cannot really solve those uh, crises if we just uh, follow the very national uh, approaches. And two crises that we have been uh, uh, in, uh, the COVID crisis, uh, you know, if we would, if countries would treat the right to health uh, differently, uh, I understand it's nothing probably or, or not much to deal with cultural, although there could be some aspects. But uh, if countries do deal with the uh, COVID uh, crisis differently, that of course affects all of us. Now, if we take migration as you may call it uh, positive, you may call it crisis. I am coming now from the region where we. Uh, where migrants are being used as, as weapon in, in the nowadays uh, uh, political arena by our neighboring country. So here, uh, again, if we would just approach this issue nationally, it would be very, very difficult to address uh, the whole issue of uh, vulnerable populations like migrants. So here there is, of course, very uh, close connection with the declaration, uh, even though I, I agree with uh, uh, Professor um, that uh, probably at the time when it was adopted for, for various reasons, uh, because of Soviet regime, because of colonial regime, um, there could have been some claims with universality. But I believe that in 1993, with the Vienna Congress, somehow we already put the stamp uh, of, of universality also on, on this document. But my point is uh, that uh, without universality, I think nowadays, it would be very, very difficult to address those global crises uh, that all of us are facing, even though we would like to have very, very national uh, approaches to, to that. Thank you so much, Professor Lyra, for bringing forward different aspects of micro identities that need to be considered in this conversation. And uh, of course, the whole idea of how COVID may have sort of brought us all together as well as exposed the differences that we are living in makes this conversation extremely pertinent. Um, I would request Professor Murthy to uh, shed some light from the Indian experience maybe. Um, okay, I'll uh, see there is a lot of work being done by scholars from the global south, particularly in Latin America, Africa and South Asia, who while criticizing the universalizing language have put forth uh, regional interpretations of human rights which bring out rich and uh, diverse ways of looking at human rights by including the vulnerabilities in different cultures and regions and contextualizing these within the human rights discourse. A universalist perspective on human rights can achieve some degree of progress. For instance, in the case of historically vulnerable sections such as the women, however, its utility to understand deeper localized rights-based issues is limited as has been shown by global South scholars. In fact, scholars have uh, identified four different stands of uh, 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 argument between universality and relativity. And particularly we need to eschew the two extremes uh, the radical cultural relativist believes that values should be solely guided by culture. And uh, on the other hand, radical universalists deny any influence of culture in the determination of values that constitute the human rights norms. Jack Donnelly argues that this position is totally unmaintainable. UDHR is an important document since 
for the first time almost the entire world came together to reaffirm the individual rights moreover subsequent international regional and national human rights documents utilized and evolved the language of the udhr in their own context which gave a strong impetus to its quote and quote universal appeal at the same time though the catalyst movement for udhr was the horrors of world war 2 there have been many other horror movements which have led to more udhr movements for instance rwanda leading to the african regional human rights regime thus the origin of udhr may not be the main point anymore rather it may be the evolution subsequently thank you thank you professor murthy um i'll quickly move on to my next question how much of modernity or modernism is relevant for human rights given that post modernity is the is a beginning which is characterized by uncertainty and unpredictability there is a possibility of the rights discourse going off course if the true ambitions of udhr have to be actualized keeping in mind that udhr is a modernist dream and a worthy dream at that wouldn't we need modernist imagination again uh, may i request professor martin shinen to comment on this please thank you very much i i indeed would like to present the defense of modernity and claim that we need more of the modernity which i see as the triumph of reason um and rationalism and this is easily lost in the current world of uncertainty and unpredictability where it seems that there are no clear answers but that is simply because of the complexity of the world and the and the seeming conflicts of the different answers we give to different questions i think we need uh within human rights law much more of an evidence based approach that mere normativity cannot guide us we need evidence and i think we need the evidence on both sides of the equation quite often we assess human rights as a distinction between whether there's a mere impact interference or is it a violation and maybe a problem of human rights law is to 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 be too much guided by the intuition of natural law thinking i see a human rights i know a human rights violation when when i see one i don't think that is good enough anymore with the complexities and uncertainties of the world uh, above all because often human rights are on both sides of the equation we have different human rights of different human beings competing at the same time and demanding different answers so we can't simply say the best possible level for human rights protection we we must be more nuanced and there i think there is a need for a third to reason and evidence and that is more modernity of 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 trusting the science i mean multidisciplinary science for instance in the context of covid not only medical sciences but also social sciences and assessing what is the benefit towards the legitimate aim that we are striving at we accept the aim as legitimate but what is the benefit we achieve towards it by restricting human rights we assess and we even try to quanti- quantify and we do the same on the side of the rights we try to assess and quantify how deep is the human rights intrusion and then we do the proportionality test between the two it is it's an analytically structured rational evidence based even quantitatively measured or close to mathematical formula in the in the sense of uh, robert alexi that is needed so uh, in short the answer to complexity is more evidence more reason more rationality that is modernity thank you thank you so much professor martin uh, it seems like it in a way ties into uh, professor murthy's last comment and it leads me to sort of think of how culture or how uh, these certain small aspects of identity may sometimes in fact be used to uh, put certain rights at the back pedestal 
which has which we've seen happen very frequently with women rights across the world i would say and uh, this this move towards reason this move towards modernity uh, which in a sense may be a move towards uh, universalism again might might be the answer there uh, yes uh, uh, Professor Mark Tushnet, may I request you to offer some perspective regarding this question? Yes, so uh, I, I'd like to pick up on uh, and, and, and challenge uh, a theme that Professor Shinen just articulated. I am more or less working on a, an article related to the COVID pandemic with the working title, Trust the Science. Um, and I, I would note that there's a postmodernist critique of science as well as a postmodernist critique of universality uh, in, in the normative uh, domain. In the um, scientific domain, uh, the critique takes two forms. One is foundational, um, that, uh, that when you get to the foundations of any science, you discover an enormous amount of sociological variation and determination of what counts as a scientific finding. Uh, more significant for our current uh, concerns is the critique that science as practice is practiced within bureaucratic structures and uh, corporate settings, which affects the uh, output, which affects what counts as uh, the science that we're asked to trust. Um, and so uh, once again, as in the domain of norm normativity, um, I think that the claims for local specificity as against universality are um, strong, uh, even with respect to the um, techniques of uh, specification that Professor Scheinin uh, referred to. Um, I, I think I'll, 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 I'll stop with, with that. I just do want to stress the uh, general uh, um, perspective of post-modernity, which is, I think I need to keep emphasizing, quite corrosive of the idea of universality pretty much across all domains. Um, I find the critique persuasive, uh, and that leaves me wondering what is um, left of, uh, what remains of the discourse of universal human rights, uh, which I want to stress continues to be motivationally significant in many, many settings. And so there's this tension between the postmodernist analytic point and the motivational uh, force of the claims of universality. Thank you for bringing forward that counter argument. And of course, if uh, when the question tends to become the motivations, in fact, in terms of what is universal and why that is held to be universal, then definitely it casts a, a sort of shadow of doubt on the entire discussion. Uh, Professor Engel, may I request you to please come in? Sure, well, I, um, I really thank um, both uh, Mark and Martin for their, their commentary so far. This is, um, you know, from an analytical standpoint, this is not my area of expertise, but what I, what strikes me and what I'd like to offer to the discussion is a, um, is what we've seen play out in the COVID context and, and the, the, the utter lack of um, consensus globally on legal approaches to things that have universal impacts uh, hypothetically, right, but but locally are having very disparate impacts. So things like vaccine, um, allegations of vaccine hoarding by the Western countries, um, the, uh, you know, the, the, the differences in how vaccine mandates are playing out in the workplace here in the US, 
Um, and, and then, you know, also, and this is my, uh, you know, my own lens from here in the US and, and my own expertise is the local battles over um, masking mandates even, particularly in, uh, I mentioned the workplace, but also in schools. In the US, we are seeing battles uh, locally and in states regarding uh, what, what some are calling um, bodily integrity. So there's this co-opting by those who oppose masking mandates and vaccine mandates about, you know, they're co-opting the language of reproductive rights, which um, is, is deeply troubling to me. So, um, you know, I don't have any answers, but I think the law in general is struggling. Um, and I think we have, um, we're facing really a reckoning um, globally about this unequal distribution of both legal, but also the public health solutions to the pandemic. And, um, you know, I'll leave it there, but I do, I do think it's, it's the salient um, question of our time because we, we really don't know what is next with the Omicron variant and, um, you know, the, the possibility that this could, uh, you know, the, the, the pandemic is still raging in parts of the world and indeed in parts of the US um, as well. And, and we, um, we just haven't settled universally on a set of protocols. Yes, I, even I feel like this uh, American example of how mask mandates and vaccine mandates have gone has been a very interesting sort of uh, thing to learn from to some uh, in some respects where it's not just uh, it's not probably just signs that people are hearing to anymore and there have been uh, so many movements in which uh, leaders from micro identity groups have to have come forward and also come in support of vaccine mandates for example uh, pope had issued a statement uh, sometime in the beginning of this year regarding vaccines. And it was seen as a very important and powerful step uh, towards pushing uh, the global uh, acceptance towards going ahead and getting these vaccines. So uh, interesting times <laughs> that, we, that we have uh, witnessed. So uh, moving on to my next question. Uh, this is with respect to multiple loci of power which have been created in postmodernity and how uh, the state-centric approach towards human rights maybe lost some of its relevance with the growth of intermediate institutions like family, religion, communities, and corporations that exert uh, power in the society now. And whether, there, whether it is the time to think of a remedy mechanism at an international plane which can develop outside of the state paradigm and which can impose direct responsibilities on some of these new actors that play such a major role in terms of how communities respond. Uh, may I request uh, Professor Mark Tushnit to comment on this first? Yes, so thank you. Um, it's clear to me that, that the uh, paradigm of rights, whether it they be characterized as uh, universal human rights or as local specifications, uh, depending on uh, various circumstances, is uh, increasingly actually is, is analytically uh, applicable to uh, these these so-called new uh, actors. Uh, I would note that a fair amount of my work in domestic US constitutional law uh, has been aimed at, as I would put it, establishing that the uh, sharp distinction historically drawn between public actors and private actors is um, problematic uh, or needs to be problematized. And so, from my perspective, again, coming from a domestic US uh, setting, um, the idea that uh, rights claims can be asserted against 
non-state actors, uh, these transnational bodies and, and, and uh, corporations, um, is pretty straightforward. Um, and I think, um, independent of the analytic point, um, uh, which is complicated to make, and so I won't even try to do it here, uh, the normative claim uh, that uh, these new actors should be subjected to uh, right scrutiny is quite powerful. Again, bracketing for the moment, what counts as uh, right scrutiny? Again, uh, Martin Scheinin's observation that in the context of these, in particular, uh, in the context of these kinds of claims, the rights on both sides argument um, can be uh, quite uh, significant. Thank you so much, Professor Krishna. Uh, I'll move to Professor Lyra very quickly to respond to this question. Um, indeed, I think the times when we were speaking to the students about the state and individual relationship, when we talk about the human rights, I think these times uh, are already in, in uh, behind uh, for a long time. And uh, of course, the example of um, uh, increased, um, increased power of corpor corporations um, clearly shows that it would be, um, it, it would be difficult uh, to say that uh, on one hand, the state-centric uh, approach um, has lost its relevance. I think it, it's not but it's also a perfect example to show uh, how uh, important it is to explore also those uh, horizontal, um, uh, horizontal relationships when we speak about uh, human rights. Now, the, the problem or, or from, from practical perspective, when you um, uh, try to see why uh, corporations have to be in, involved in something what sometimes they perceive is an obligation of the state, um, one, one of the uh, arguments that usually comes in, in place is that actually all international human rights framework, all the treaties, uh, they're basically meant for states. They are made between states. They're not really uh, meant for, for uh, private entities, private individuals. And uh, this then leaves uh, us with a question, do we develop other kinds of treaties do we leave um, uh, everything what is happening, let's say, in, in the private uh, field vis-a-vis uh, -vis the individuals, corporations, business-to-business -business relationships, or do we leave it for self-regulation? Now, at this stage, I think uh, uh, even though there are really very good uh, examples where these horizontal, um, uh, horizontally binding human rights, if, if I could call so, uh, could work very well in particular, for instance, that some so-called responsible businesses are introducing the requirements for their supplier. So in their supply chain, they understand that if uh, something happens even quite far from their uh, main office, that they might be responsible for, for those violations, they might be complicit. So there is this requirement uh, in the supply chain. And, and for me, it's, it is one of the examples of this horizontal, let's say, uh, uh, relationship uh, in a mandatory way uh, for human rights. But still, if we, um, apart from these uh, good examples, I think the general situation uh, shows that uh, although businesses, of course, contribute a lot of good to, to human rights and human rights protection, that we still have a lot of problems. And those problems uh, cannot be uh, resolved uh, and, and businesses cannot be just encouraged by themselves, by self-regulation. So uh, I see really a state uh, role still uh, very pertinent. And uh, for instance, in the European Union, we had uh, long discussions whether it has to be voluntary to engage businesses in, in better protection of human rights and more direct protection, or it, it should be something um, uh, that would be mandatory. And we are still in this dilemma, this has not been solved, but the tendencies that we have been seeing is that the state is trying also to regulate and interfere in, in these relationships because uh, for the time being, alternative mechanisms, as far as I know, they are not really uh, so uh, much existent or, or at least prevalent. Yes, I think this example for corporations and their interaction with human rights is an excellent one in this regard because 
uh, at least for the last three decades now, there has been uh, an effort from the international community to create some sort of an obligation, but it's just not sort of come out in an obligatory manner. There are just various versions of voluntary codes. And Europe is definitely leading the way in this shift with the duty of uh, vigilance law in France, as well as to some extent, the Modern Slavery Act in UK. So thank you for that perspective, uh, Professor Lyra. Um, I'll move on to Professor Murthy for his uh, comment on this question now. Um, okay. Uh, yeah, the state, uh, the uh, power of the state has been dented a great deal over the years as a result of the progress of the uh, international human rights law and other uh, branches. Uh, today, uh, the corporations have, are wielding a lot of power and so are, uh, for instance, uh, um, the religious uh, organizations or even families. Uh, in fact, there is an increasing realization and the normative framework is also trying to keep pace with these uh, um, changes in the shift of power. Uh, particularly if you look at the Convention on the Rights of the Child, uh, which lists uh, the family as a duty bearer in addition to the state. And uh, uh, there is also a, a, a normative framework trying to hold uh, the businesses accountable. But uh, there is a, a, a one major issue there. Um, uh, like, in fact, uh, the growth of business and its intersection with human rights is a, a very important example for the possibility of uh, evolution of international human rights law outside the state paradigm. But uh, the, as I mentioned, the, there is a, a major uh, concern that uh, who is responsible for ensuring human rights and who will hold uh, the corporate entities accountable for their wrongs and who will remedy the situation in case of any violation. And uh, these private corporate entities may have various justifications for their existence and their role in societies. For instance, they are responsible for their shareholders and are concerned with their profits or bottom lines. Whereas the state can be seen as ensuring the welfare of the people, this may not be the case with private actors of uh, different kinds. Uh, however, international law is making positive strides in this direction and the most significant examples of horizontal effect of international level can be found in the UN human rights treaty bodies, general comments and views on individual communications. And if you look at the jurisprudence of the five treaty bodies, um, the human rights committee, the committee on economic, social, cultural rights, the Committee on Torture, the Committee on Elimination of Racial Discrimination, and the Committee on Elimination of Discrimination uh, Against Women, shows that despite the lack of direct horizontal effect in the relevant treaties, each body deals with situation in which interference with human rights was caused by non-state actors. There are many instances in which treaty bodies uphold states' obligations to protect human rights from the harmful conduct of non-state actors, although the standards of the obligation differ depending on which non-state actor caused the harm. So jurisprudence involving individuals generally centers on due diligence. Uh, for instance, the obligation to investigate, prevent, and punish human rights interference by non-state actors. There are several uh, cases of individual communications in which these standards have been laid down by the treaty bodies. Thank you, Professor Murthy. I'll quickly move on to my last question. Um, this is with respect to the growth of new technologies, which have now created new participants in the international community, like the growth of self-driving cars, drone technology, or algorithms that determine the threat levels of individuals. Uh, what is the role of international human rights regime in mitigating the impact of such new technology as well as artificial intelligence on the human rights of especially vulnerable communities? Uh, may I request Professor Martin 
and to start the discussion on this question. Thank you very much. Uh, I would like to contest your uh, assumption of new participants in the international community. And, and my answer basically is we must keep the human in the loop. Uh, this is because both morality, where human rights has its origin, and law, which is the articulation of positive, valid, legally binding norms, are between humans. So humans are those with rights and humans are those with obligations, including through fictitious legal persons such as corporations. The human is always in the loop. And I think it is crucial that also in the world of algorithms, we do not accept the idea of a black box, a self-learning algorithm which corrects its course and nobody is accountable. I think there must be chains of accountability and therefore rightly so the, the technologically inspired community within, within the field of law insists on algorithmic transparency. I think that is a very proper prior, pr priority matter to, to call for that we must be able to see what happens within those boxes. They shouldn't be black impenetrable boxes. We need to have accountability. And that can only happen if we know uh, how these algorithms work and that should be secured. Maybe there should be even a moratorium to secure uh, that, that human, humans are kept in the loop because there must be humans who can be made accountable for harm to human rights. Thank you. Wonderful perspective of keeping the human in the loop. Thank you so much, Professor Martin. Uh, I'll move to Professor Lyra with respect to this question now. Now, of course, we are all very fond of these new technologies and, and uh, tremendous opportunities that it creates. And like in, in the legal field uh, with law enforcement, all these uh, fancy uh, things that um, hopefully will, will make life um, uh, easier. But also if we uh, look at, at the vulnerable uh, populations, access to medical diagnostics and, and things like that. So, so I would say, like to say that it's not just uh, sometimes it's oversimplified and said that uh, uh, technology somehow will create only problems uh, for for the uh, for human rights and, and for human rights implementation. But of course, there are uh, also tremendous opportunities. Now, of course, there are uh, concerns. And um, uh, again, here, uh, I feel that there is sometimes this oversimplification saying that, well, there will be these new things. They're not being regulated. There should be some kind of new regulation. But then if you look at the type of problems that are being discussed, now, a number of those problems, they actually have very close connection with, with the articles. Uh, I counted at least five articles in the uh, Universal Decla Declaration. So that means that indeed some things are uh, regulated. And indeed, uh, the international um, uh, uh, human rights protection regime has not lost its um, uh, relevance here. And um, of course, uh, probably what we have to do more is, is um, uh, try to, um, to go through uh, this human rights um, uh, lens uh, when any kind of uh, new regulation is, is being adopted. And just an example uh, that we have right now in, in the European Union, you, you probably have heard that uh, the European Commission uh, in uh, spring of this year has proposed I think it's one of the biggest, I think it's over 100 uh, pages uh, proposal uh, for the regulation on artificial intelligence. And actually uh, one of the um, uh, reasons why uh, this regulation is, uh, or proposal is not uh, going on so smoothly, even everybody wants it, uh, is namely that uh, the international um, uh, human rights bodies, national human rights bodies have been raising um, issues uh, with this, uh, regulation that uh, it does not actually, uh, it, it's not compatible on, on some respect with human rights. And uh, of course, there are a number of issues that um, I don't want now to, uh, to, to spend too much time of, of the other speakers to, to, to talk about it. But one of the um, uh, sensitive issues is about, uh, again, this algorithm uh, decisions and overall algorithm uh, governance, which um, it seems that it will um, uh, or it might have an important effect and a negative effect 
on uh, social net um, uh, systems and, and how the social nets uh, uh, function. So uh, I think we just have to, to um, really uh, use what we have in the international uh, human rights regime to really make sure that uh, anything that comes new uh, with these new actors, I agree with Professor Shannon, that in terms of international law and international public law, they're not actors and hopefully they won't be, at least not as, as we are alive. But um, uh, we really have to, to um, bring what we have because this is not outdated. Uh, this international uh, human rights regime is still very, very valid. It just needs to be interpreted in, in a probably different context, but this is normal for, for human rights bodies. Thank you so much, Professor Naira. I see Professor Murthy wants to make a comment, please, sir. Yeah, um, if I'm, um, I want to turn the question on its head <laughs> and uh, instead, you know, we, um, we need to be, you know, um, for instance, uh, we must be asking how artificial intelligence can be used to further the rights of vulnerable communities, uh, especially since it has great potential uh, for furthering the uh, rights. Uh, in asking this question, uh, we would also be asking how to responsibly use such technology. Uh, so therefore, more than a regulatory regime, uh, it might be pertinent to discuss whether the use of such technology is for furthering the dignity of individuals or treat it as a means to some other end. Yeah, thank you. Thank you so much, Professor Murthy. Uh, at, with this, we are at the end of our time. So I would like to extend my gratitude to all the panelists for being with us today. Mm -hmm.